You are listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina with Ola Shenoui, Rose Manley and Richard Moore. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Orla Shinoui. Hello. In our in our Amsterdam <laughs> studio. And Happy New Year, my beautiful people. And oh, all right, Orla, calm down. And and, <laughs> and, uh, and there's, no, there's no need for that. That's Orla's New Year's uh, resolution, Richard. And, oh and, uh, and Rose Manley here in the South London, Southwest London studio. You're right, Richard. Yeah, that all right. That's better, Rose. That's better, that's better, that's better, Rose. Tone it oh, right. God. Keeping with the if you start off like that, there's nowhere to go, is there? We need, oh, my God. To... That is like that is low-level entry, Richard. There's way more to come from that. Well, we've been podcasting for the last hour, but off, off the tape, haven't we? One hour and 20, It's an actually, evening yeah. podcast, and uh, we, we've covered a we've lot of ground a already. We've quite We've covered social media, vulnerability, shame, New Year's resolutions. Yeah, all this would be a, this would be a case of overtraining if we were cyclists, wouldn't it? <laughs> and now we're just going to go we're down too many kilometres. I'm going to bonk now. <laughs> we are the Anna Anim- Van Vluten of the podcasting world. Um, and Not that she's bonking; she's just training a lot. She's training a lot, apparently. Yes, indeed. Well, it is her first uh, podcast. I feel like I have to up it a bit now. It is our first podcast of yeah, twenty. So happy New Year and nine, all that. Rubbish. Nineteen. Um, it's January. Twenty twenty. It's dark you outside. It's really cold. You and, Richard, Richard, you're right. Twenty twenty. Oh, so yes, I love how you just ploughed on as well. Twenty twenty, and we're it's dark and cold, and we're really excited about the forthcoming season. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are so let's just roll with it people Come okay on. um well in this episode of the cycling podcast femina um gather yourselves please we're going to be uh each picking a couple of things that we're looking forward to or moderately excited about um <laughs> in richard's case <laughs> and uh and we've well th- th- there has been a bit of news hasn't there all have you got a news roundup for us please yeah, we've had a little bit of racing, which is nice at this time of year. Obviously, it's been uh, in Australia where it's slightly warmer and sunnier than here. The Australian Road Nationals won by Amanda Spratt of uh, Mitchelton Scott with Justine Barrow of Rock Salt Attacker finishing second and a 1-3 for Mitchelton Scott. Grace Brown finishing in third. And uh, earlier in the week, 19-year-old Sarah Gigante followed up in last year's Elite Women's National Road Race title with a win in the time trial. Such a huge, huge talent there. Um, away from racing, Lorena Vibes, that situation um, between her and Park Del Valkenberg has been resolved, we understand, after the team took steps to bring the case to court for a breach of contract. Um, the Dutch champion, world number one rider, refused to race um, if she had to stay with the team. She had such a stellar 2019, just as a quick reminder, um, and had had quite a number of offers, we understand, and wanted to leave the team, but she had been signed to stay with them until 2021. Um, so now both parties have agreed that she will race with the squad until the transfer window opens on the 1st of June this year, but team management have said that the resolution keeps neither side happy so that's going to be an interesting all start to the year uh, for both parties there Speaking of trouble times for Park Hotel Valkenberg rider Sophie De Voist was supposed to leave the team for Mitchelton Scott this year but as expected um, the Australian squad have confirmed that that is now on hold until the investigation into a positive test for anabolic steroids is resolved. Um, Mariana Voss has had to call an early end to her cross season after finishing fifth at the Dutch National. She, she said she needs surgery to correct a nod in an artery in her groin apparently. So she's having surgery this week. She'll be out for six weeks which would take her to the end of February, meaning that she'll miss the worlds in Switzerland. Um, but the hope is that she can recover and get back on track on time uh, for the road season to not be hampered too much. Um, those Dutch nationals, incidentally, won by Sailing Del Carmen Alvarado, who's skipping the world under 23s to focus on the elite race at the worlds. That's despite being just 21. And Sana Kant won the Belgian cross championships. Um, speaking of surgery, then, Pauline Ferran Prevo has had successful surgery for a second time for a problem she's been suffering since. Uh, 2015, which causes pain and circulation problems, but we don't know how long she will be out for. So that's a, a very scattered, very bitty news roundup to start 2020. 
Just to add a little to Orla's news roundup, we recorded this episode as the Women's Tour Down Under got underway, so we'll talk about that and the Cadell Evans Ocean Road Race, which is part of the Women's World Tour now, of course, in next month's episode. But the first two stages of the Tour Down Under have been won by Australians Chloe Hosking, with a long sprint to take stage one, and the new National Road Race champion Amanda Spratt, who won an exciting crosswind buffeted stage two to take over the leader's jersey. As I record this, there are two stages left, and we'll talk more about the Women's Tour Down Under and the Cadell Evans Ocean Road Race in next month's episode. Well, Orla, um, not much racing, uh, as you said, but lots of training for Annemiek van Vluten. And uh, I thought we'd start off just by talking about her because you, you pointed us to a blog that she'd written um, in Dutch. I think you've translated it for us. But just to put to put that in some context, there was a post on Twitter tonight um, about the, uh, the rides that pro riders have been doing so far this year or logging on Strava. Now, not every rider logs every ride on Strava but it's fascinating because of all the the pros men and women Egan Bernal has ridden the most kilometers on in rides on on Strava 2,638 kilometers but in second place ahead of Richie Port, Jack Haig, Robert Stannard, Michael Valgren and a whole host of other men is Annemiek van Vluten with 2,636 kilometers um just an extraordinary uh, volume of training already for her this year. And this blog explains a little bit about the training that she's been doing, I believe. Yeah, it was absolutely fascinating. It's on Annemiek's own uh, personal website. It is all in Dutch. You can obviously Google Translate. Um, But I find it fascinating because she's talking about training with the men and it's the second year in a row that she started her year training with the guys. Um, And it just spoke to me of how much she gets out of these sessions. And I guess the difference it can make, and it's not the same for everyone, but for someone like Annemiek, the difference it can make to be on a team that has a men's squad and to to jump into that men's training every now and again. And I mean, arguably, she's one of very, very few who'd be able to do that. Um, But she had said hi in her blog that she's usually the strongest at the camp, but obviously with the men, she's she's the, the weakest. So... She says in these camps, it's always important to go outside of your comfort zone. And she says that she's constantly outside of her comfort zone ever so slightly. And so that's a really good thing for her. Um, She talked about pushing herself in the climbs of the likes of Adam Yates. And when she couldn't keep up, um, the women's team manager at camp would pace her back um, in a car so that she can get back on the grip quite quickly. And that means that this year she spent less time riding by herself and much more time with the guys. So she said that last year she'd sometimes ride for seven out of eight hour rides by herself, which obviously is a training and and mental fortitude, if nothing else. Um, um, but she also talks about the chat at dinner being different and um, it seems that she finds that quite refreshing. So, you know, a change of scenery is always good. And one thing that I thought was really interesting is that with the guys, she said with her wee stops, she has to be really, really quick because otherwise she has to get paced onto the back of the group whenever the guys have all had a nature break. So, we've, I mean, we've obviously talked about this before, about the importance of nature breaks in women's cycling. And, I mean, it might sound a bit superficial, a bit flippant, but if you can train yourself to be able to get off your bike and wee really quickly and get back on and, and suit it up as quickly as possible. They're just little seconds that make a bit of a difference. And I imagine in a women's camp, there's maybe a little bit more waiting or because everyone's doing the same thing at the same time, um, there's not that urge and necessity to get back on again. Um, but yeah, she just said that um, because they do a camp that's A to B, so not coming back to the same hotel every night, it's like nine, ten days of travelling across southern Spain, um, that she just gets so much out of just keeping up with the guys and being part of that group. It was a really fascinating insight. It's on her on her website if you read Dutch, um, and if not, I'm sure Google Translate will be able to help sufficiently to be able to understand it. But yeah, it gave a real insight into the level of training. And as you say, the volume, she mentioned one training day, which is 240 kilometres. So she said it's great because they know they stop for lunch at 130 kilometres. So you've got that to break up the day. I mean, insane level but of training. It, it, yeah, it's, it, that was, you know, considering the distance is that she typically races um, mm, mm. it'd be equivalent to a man training over 350 400 kilometers because she's going above you know the the sorts of distances and her main targets this year some of the Olympic road race you know quite a lot shorter than that mm. so it's interesting but it's obviously working for her I do love the idea of these Mitchell and Scott training camps that go place to place I think mm. Matt White was telling us about those I think that's a great idea I'd like to know actually how that kind of came about whether that was um, I don't know whether it says it in the blog, Orla, but was it Anna Meek's decision to be part of that or was that kind of suggested to her or was she invited to it? Or And 
yeah, like what the kind of processes behind that um, would be. Yeah, I don't know. She just says it's her second year doing it and the rest of her team are mostly in Australia uh, competing for the national championships, obviously being part of uh, Mitchell and Scott. So I don't know if it was a team management decision. She doesn't she doesn't go into it in her blog. She just says it's the second year that she's done it. So I guess however that was set up last year was the same again this year. I'm not sure. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. Well, that's Seb PK, the voice of Radio Tour at the Tour de France, interrupting January's episode of the cycling podcast, Femina, to remind me to tell you that this episode is supported by Hello Fresh. And, well, hello, Lionel Bernie. What are you doing here? Hang on. Hello, where Richard. Have, where, have, where have Rose and Orla gone? I'm also interrupting the episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina uh, because, well, you and I had our deliveries of HelloFresh uh, recipe boxes. Sorry, to sorry Rose and Orla. Um, this week, HelloFresh takes all of the time and stress out of going to the supermarket to do your food shopping Fresh, healthy recipes are delivered to your door with all the ingredients needed for those recipes in the quantities that you need them. So you're never going to be running out of uh, smoked paprika or uh, ras al hanout. I mentioned those two ingredients (laughs) because I had a very tasty Moroccan um, chickpea and lentil stew last night, which took me around 25 minutes to make. Um, Very nice it was too. And all of our listeners can get 50% off their first box of HelloFresh meals and 35% off the next three boxes by going to hellofresh.co.uk and using the code CYCLING1. Richard, you also had uh, a delivery this week. What have you had so far? Uh, so far, I had the veggie tostadas, and it, it says it, it, that, that uh, it takes 20 minutes to put these together. Um, I usually take these uh, things with a bit of a pinch of salt, and there is a pinch of salt in, in, the, in the recipe. Um, but I did. It was very, very quick indeed, and they were really, really tasty. Um, and uh, kidney beans, peppers, carrots, uh, some Mexican spice in there. And they were very nice indeed. We had them for uh, our meal on Sunday evening, um, and you get lots of... Uh, wholemeal tortillas lots left over as well so yeah very very nice indeed lovely and not a recipe that i would probably have tackled without the exact ingredients as supplied by whole fresh and step-by-step instructions well that is exactly it, isn't it you get the recipe cards which give you the step-by-step instructions so um even you know uh, this may surprise you richard but i'm not a michelin starred chef not yet, does, anyway. Does but even I can me. follow simple instructions. And uh, like I say, the, it's not just the time saved by not having to go to the supermarket to do a, sort of a big full weekly shop. It's the time saved having everything already measured out for you and having the instructions uh, so easy to follow. And you're still on a vegetarian vegetarian diet, aren't you, Rich? Regime. And every week there are 21 different recipes to um, suit all taste styles and uh, dietary requirements as well so if you would like to get 50% off your first box of HelloFresh and then 35% off the next three boxes go to hellofresh.co.uk and use the code cycling1 now off you pop Lionel and uh, Rose and Orla come back in please I know I've got to go and make um, honey and miso cod well we're interrupted there by uh, by, by Lionel Bernie but we're back and back with uh, Rose and Orla and uh, we're going to look ahead to two things each we've picked out that we're looking forward to this year. We're going to hear a few interviews as well. Um, you and I, Orla, have picked a similar... Well, it, we can roll them together, I think. But, I mean, I'm, I am don't know if looking forward is the right expression, but I'm curious about how the Women's World Tour is going to uh, shape, shape up this year. And you are looking forward to one of the aspects of that, which is um, greater increased live TV coverage. Um, but... I mean, on the because I, I'm not sure. I think when we last recorded, they just announced the the teams that had been given World Tour licenses, and and initially, Michelin Scott's uh, license wasn't approved, but it has been now. So there there are eight teams. They were looking for five originally, but they said they would accept up to eight. So it's Ali BTC Ljubljana, um, Canyon Shram, CCC Live, FDJ, um, Michelin Scott, Movistar. Sunweb and Trek Segafredo. Um, we covered the absence of Bulls Dolmans. That was the main. That's the main sort of omission. I mean, one or two of those teams, perhaps surprising. Only two of them are standalone women's teams. The rest are all attached to men's teams. Um, so no, no. I mean, 
the UCI will be greatly encouraged, I'm sure, by the fact that um, that you know they filled all eight spots, and the the goal over three years is to get up to fifteen women's world tour teams. We're going to hear from Morgan Gauthier in a moment. She runs women's cycling at the UCI. Um, so what it means for the riders is a minimum salary at fifteen thousand euros in twenty twenty. That'll be twenty thousand euros in twenty twenty one and twenty seven thousand five hundred in twenty twenty two. And then from 2023, parity with the men's protein level, which is 30,000 euros. So in four years, those minimum salaries are going to go from 15,000 to 30,000. They're going to double per rider. That's, that's you know, it's a, it's a big a big pressure on the teams there to, to raise their sponsorship yeah, accordingly. Yeah, it's a huge uh, amount of riders. It's a huge amount either. of riders. And, and, it's, and it's pressure also on, on the UCI to make the world to work and become commercially attractive enough that the teams will be able to do that. Um, it means some other things for the riders as well, health insurance, maternity insurance, um, other insurance policies that have to be provided now um, by the teams and more added as we get into years one, uh, two and three of the Women's World Tour. But um, it'll be interesting to see just if these races look different, if they feel different. Um, but I guess the biggest impact will be on the on those riders who are being paid this minimum salary now. Yeah, and I can't imagine any immediate impact that we're going to see. It's one of those that is going to hopefully, the aim being that it will transform the sport over the next, I guess, five to ten years. But the thing that I am really genuinely looking forward to is the the live streaming of more, of more races, of every single Women's World Tour race. And I have to admit to a certain scepticism that this was going to... A, be realistic and B, actually be carried out um, because we had the likes of, um, you know, certain classics, ASU organised classics where they said, yeah, it's OK, we'll, we'll, skip, we'll jump down a level, we'll not bother with Women's World Tour status because we don't want to have to deliver on live streaming. And I thought that was going to be um, the scenario which would have made an absolute farce of really this new two-tiered system and, and what the races have to do to be a Women's World Tour race. Um, and I guess a farce of this push to be one sort of movement towards bringing the sport forward. Um, but it seems that that is what's going to happen. Um, certainly from your interview, which you're about to listen to, Richard, um, Morgan says that, that the races have committed to 45 minutes of live coverage in some format or other. Again, for the women's tour, that's going to be really interesting because that's a long way off what they've been able to do. And for the women's tour, it's much more challenging because it is um, over several days and the, and the sort of terrain that they cover isn't great when it comes to 4G coverage, which we've talked about before. Um, but flesh will on, uh, Liege based on Liege. How brilliant will it be to be able to watch 45 minutes of that live, the last 45 minutes? Hopefully more than that. That's just the minimum requirement. But that's what I'm really excited about, getting to watch these women racing. And, and hopefully that will make for really dynamic racing as well and give a, a great platform for the women to be able to showcase just what they can do. I can't wait. Well, on that, you spoke to Alison Jackson and you signing for Team Sunweb at their launch in December. Um, and she had an interesting comment to make about the potential effect of the TV cameras being there on the racing. So what about 2020 then? It's the first year that the new reforms in the Women's World Tour come into force. Do you expect it to feel any different? Do you, th- do you expect to see any change immediately? Yeah, I think it'll be slow. Some of the some of the new changes are a little more, I guess, for the, the structure side. So as a rider, when we race, we you know, you, you can think of just racing and the racing is going to be the same. Hopefully, though, the more media coverage, like it might make some other teams a little more dynamic in the racing because, you know, the TV time now can mean bringing in more sponsorship dollars, a better opportunity for them, visibility on those lower teams when you're when you're actually trying to stand out as an individual. So I yeah, the I think the racing will just be getting better and better, more aggressive. And then hopefully, yeah, we can build up our, our league and. Uh, have a lot more of those top tier level teams. So what are your specific targets then for the year? What goals have you set for yourself? I'm really looking forward to the classics. So starting out the year with some real hard racing. I'm really looking forward to racing with um, the level of teammates that I have and just playing with numbers in the final. And yeah, I, so the spring classes, I, I can't wait. Bad weather, good weather. It's going to be a good, a good season. That was Alison Jackson of Team Sunweb, and you signing for them. And uh, 
I think we'll hear from another Sunweb writer a bit later on. But let's hear a little bit from Morgan Gauthier uh, from the UCI, uh, just on how year one of the, well, it's not year one of the Women's World Tour, but it's year one of the, the, the kind of ambitious new Women's World Tour, how that's going to pan out in 2020. Can you tell people, I mean, followers of, of women's cycling, what it will mean for them next year in terms of watching the sport? You know, what what's it going to mean in terms of especially TV coverage? So the, the main point for that, we set up a reform uh, last year uh, that have been presented last year to, to the seminar and that will take place for the first time uh, for 2020 season. Uh, and one of the, the main criteria uh, for the Women's World Tour event uh, is the live TV production, which means that all events uh, which are part of the series UCI Women's World Tour next year uh, will have a live TV production of a minimum of 45 minutes. And the other point to, to ensure that it's followed, like we need, we ask the organizer to sign engagement form, and they all sign engagement forms, which show also that the, all of that which are in the Women's World Tour for the moment are ready to do the, the step. We, we are not coming from nowhere. This year we already had 18 races on the 24, uh, 3, which were live, uh, and next year it's going to be all. So that's a, a really, really good, good point. And what's it going to mean for the, the riders on, on the World Tour teams? I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk of women cycling about minimum salaries and so on. Are those teams all, I presume, by... Um, you know, meeting the criteria that you've set, they're all they're all ready to go with some of the the changes that you want to bring in. But um, is that going to make a big difference to the the riders on those teams as well? Um, and uh, are you confident that's all going to 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 run smoothly next year? So that's really for on the team side, that was the the biggest point: the introduction of the of the minimum salary in the in the UCI regulation. Uh, all teams that have applied to the to the Women's World Tour uh, status uh, fulfilled those criteria. We've got, as I mentioned before, the all the financial criteria. Uh, we've got an external auditor with uh, with checking everything, and they are all respected at this point. That also for the rider, it's really important because they now they can really leave from. Uh, their sports and be concentrated 100% on the, on their calendar and on the bike. So that's a very important step forward, and we are really happy that uh, that many teams for the first year follow those, uh, those new regulations. The cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to our longtime supporters and sponsors, Science and Sport, for continuing to support the cycling podcast Femina in 2020. It is 2020, isn't it? Woo! We got there in the end, Richard. Um, The code (laughs) remains the same, SISCP25, if you want 25% off. Oops, sorry, I forgot to open the door there to the traditional song. You can still do it. Scienceandsport.com. 25% 25% off all your science and sport products with the code SISCP25. SISCP25. CP25. CP25. SISCP25. Absolutely oh my gosh. beautiful. Awful. Awful. Beautiful. <laughs> Sorry for starting your new, your new year like that. Right. I have no Butchering. idea how they match that up in the edit. I find it really baffling. Uh, the very clever people, our production team. We still um, sound awful, Rose, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always have to whip yeah. off my headphones because yeah. of the satellite delay. Yeah, very, I said they're very clever, not magicians. Oh, Shall we you. crack on there with... Uh, <laughs> with our, our things that we're looking forward to in 2020. Rose? Yes, well, it's kind of off the uh, back of all the chat of the Women's World Tour and the calendar. Um, it's not actually a new thing um, at all that I'm going to mention, but just having uh, the women's peloton having a full classics calendar, could that's not talking about Women's World Tour because they've had uh, Ghent Fevelhem and Ronde van Vlaanderen for years now, but um, to have all the other races also Nocker Recursa which um, actually started last year and actually completely passed me by I didn't even realise it was happening until I saw the results which uh, Lorena Weber's uh, won on, as the inaugural race but then you've also got the uh, Depana race which is 
which is World Tour, which has been around since 2018, and Dwarves de Vlaanderen that's been around since 2017. So it's just kind of nice to have these, uh, nice to see um, new-ish races um, going strong, especially when you kind of lose, like to lose Tour of California is, is a, I know we're not meant to be talking about disappointments, but to lose the Tour of California this year is a shame. To lose Imakimin Bira is also a great shame. Um, so it's kind of nice to see that other... Th- smaller Belgian classics are kind of uh, starting up and and running to join established races like Le Samin and um, Hagerland. Great, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. They all have a great atmosphere, don't they? Those oh, yeah. Belgian races. There's, uh, it's, sort of, it's just switching on a tap. Um, you, you feel like there's a there's a very receptive audience there for it. The everything about it's great. So to have women's races there as well will be will be good. And um, you said you weren't, uh, you know, we're not supposed to be uh, anticipating disappointments, but a, a rider we expect to challenge in those races would be Lorena Vibus and Orla. I gather <coughs> she and Val- uh, uh, Park Hotel Valkenberg were on your short list of things you were looking forward to in twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that in absolute confidence. Oh, no, sorry. I was oh, going. Well. I was going to say it now. I know. I was going to be a bit mean and say because I am. I am intrigued. I'm intrigued. I guess is a better way of phrasing it rather than looking forward to seeing how that's going to play out between the two of them. I mean, I might have worded it a bit more strongly uh, when we were chatting before we started <laughs> recording earlier. But how that works between Lorena Vibus and Park Hotel Falkenberg when neither side wants to be in this contract. But I wasn't going to mention it because my New Year's resolution is to give kindness to the world, unfettered, unlimited and un, um, expecting of return. I just thought I want to be love. <laughs> I sound like such a dick. Um, <laughs> we didn't want to say anything. Uh, but yeah. I, I spend a lot of time alone with my son listening to podcasts and they tend to be very American. Um, so I've become very, um, yeah, uh, Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Well, what are, yeah. Yeah, so, so I don't, be... so, so I don't want, to, so I don't want to be attracting negativity by by um, expecting negativity, and that's well, why just I didn't say want to with your that. curious, my um, curious journalistic your journalist mind. eye, your gotcha. That's, that's you know, you want to it. watch how this plays out exactly ha- with an unobjective stance. Um, you have a nice day there, Orla. Pardon? Um, you have a nice day there. Uh, <laughs> just, um, <laughs> You say that with so little feeling, it's unreal. No, um, but there's a certain uh, style to love American podcasts, isn't there? Um, uh, and the, have you, are you familiar with, uh, this is something that was discussed, we're going way off topic here, but um, very amusingly, we'd listened to this podcast, didn't we? Louis mm. Theroux and uh, oh, Adam brilliant. Buxton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they were talking about the phenomenon of vocal fry in American <laughs> podcasts, well, where so people funny. go like that to just vocal fry. Just at the end more. of the day. Just, just at the end. You know, and this is going off topic, but I have noticed even, are we allowed to mention the BBC? And this isn't a criticism necessarily, but I've noticed uh, yeah. even um, radio pieces on BBC Four these days are scripted as though it's This American Life. And mm. so, and they tell a story in a very different way these days. And the, the influence of American podcasting, even on bit, British broadcasting, audio broadcasting, is really, really remarkable these days. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, because I guess radio was always quite contained within mm. geographical boundaries mm. wasn't it and, and local radio was always a big thing but now radio audio is a is a is a it, it crosses boundaries so we're getting a lot of american and other well mainly american audio in our in our in our, in our, ear in our ears yeah. yeah but we have gone off topic a little yes. bit haven't we well what maybe we should do the rest of it where we split our phrases up into little <laughs> sentences like that because that's what they do. But they on also, this American life. I'm going to do the guttural life. fry. They also build suspense. So they'll say things like, "So we were all expecting that uh, the Women's World Tour wouldn't be streamed live. Turns out it is." Things oh, like that. that was very good. That good? Nice. Yeah, but well, actually, I think I think this. you're going to be wrong. I think you're going to be wrong, Ola, on that, and probably not all of it will be live <laughs> at the end. But we, <laughs> I have no doubt. We'll re-edit. It at won't the end of be. The year. Anyway, <laughs> we talked anyway, about that. we anyway. talked about that in the last segment. Um, what? Uh, <laughs> what <laughs> that would have been Sir Richard. Richard. No, no, that, that would have been great in the last segment, Orla. <laughs> um, what else are you looking forward to, Rose? So, uh, me? Oh, it was or, mine. Or, it was my other or, one. Or, it was the one that's or, not or, being what, mean. Sorry, my what are you looking forward to? My positive one is very much looking forward to the Olympic road race. 
partly because I'm planning to be there. So it's going to be very exciting to watch <laughs> up close and personal. Um, and because the rider that I guess we will, um, all injuries and ill health bar being, being um, ruled out, we'll all be talking about is the rider that we were talking about at the last Olympic Games, Annemiek van Vluten. Um, the amount of training that she's doing, uh, the um, focus and the commitment that she is dedicating towards the Olympics, I think are going to make for a fascinating race. And given when we saw you know, at the world's her 105 kilometre solo attack, um, we just know what kind of dominance she can produce now, even over other riders that we thought were dominant until now. So um, Annemiek van Vluten and the Olympics is what I'm very much looking forward to. And I know the rest of the field, and it would be great to, be, to see um, a much tighter competition than could um, take place. Um, it could be a brilliant race or it could be an Annemiek van Vluten solo to the finish. Very, well, very early to predict very, that. Yeah, <laughs> it's very much uh, unfinished business, isn't it? That, mm, exactly. Um, for Annemiek, but uh, what have you made of the course, Orla? Have you, uh, who, what you kind of course is it? I haven't looked at it properly, to be perfectly honest. Oh, right, honest. okay. <laughs> just um, take that out then. <laughs> I haven't prepped that far in advance yet. Um, I mean, yeah, I think just the disappointment at Mount Fuji not being included, I think, is probably the, the still the dominant headline of it all. I mean, they say it's still going to be tough, it's still going to be hard, but it goes back to that problem that we discussed when the route was announced last year. It's not going to be that, that visual showcase for the sport that I think we need when the wor- the eyes of the world are on it but hopefully that will be provided by the racing and hopefully we won't even notice the absence of Mount Fuji because the racing itself will be so great that that would be my hope anyway as is often the case well um I also asked uh, Morgan Gauthier at the UCI about the Olympics because there was a controversy that we talked about a couple of episodes ago about the the number of female riders um 67 women will line up for the women's road race, 130 men. It's something that a lot of people commented on, obviously, because uh, in this drive for parity between the, the men and the women, and there is in terms of number of events now, there's still this huge discrepancy when it comes to the road race. So I asked Morgan uh, Gote about that. We'll also hear um, Louis Chennai, the press officer at the UCI, um, who will talk about this as well. So let's hear now. Morgan Gauthier and Louis and I talking about the uh, Olympic road race. There is first few things to remember is like we've got the same number of medals for men and women in the Olympic Games. For BMX freestyle, BMX racing and mountain bike, we've got equality for men and women. We are almost there for track. The only difference is due to the composition of the team for the team sprint. Uh, sorry, the, the last one regarding cycling remaining is for, for road. For road, we when the, the women race uh, was set up, we had 45 women who can start in T4. It has increased to uh, 67 in, 20, uh, in uh, 2004. Uh, that's something that will remain like that for Tokyo. But we are, we are working uh, with the IOC and that's part of the UCI Agenda 2022 to reach the, the parity for Paris 2024. But we are in, in constant discussion with the IOC to, to develop this point. Uh, so we, we hopefully will reach uh, the, those quotas for 24. Would it be a case of the male field being reduced or is it the, the hope... Um, from the UCI's point of view that the, there would be more female riders so that the, the number of female riders increases to the, the sort of current level of the, the male riders? The overall number might not change mm. because this is the IOC which wants to keep it as it is, something like 10,500 athletes, something. Yeah. Um, so if we want to reach equality between, uh, in terms of participation and quotas, then we might have to think about uh, transferring some, some quotas from uh, one category to the other. So this is uh, this is one one of the, the scenarios that are uh, considered. But again, as uh, as Morgan said, this is ongoing. This is a discussion, which is it will take time because um, the Olympic allocation for twenty. 24 will be decided uh, at the end of next year. So in between, there will be uh, ongoing discussions with the IOC. Uh, but again, uh, it will take time and a lot of back and forth because uh, there's not only cycling, as you know, there are many sports uh, asking for same uh, 
kind of equality between uh, gender, it will have to be put in, into the context. So there's an explanation of sorts. Uh, and, you know, I think the, the numbers for these Olympic Games were set some time ago and there is uh, um, an ambition to have equal numbers of male and female athletes. But the the wider context is the UCI, the IOC are trying to reduce the total number of athletes. And it's going to be tricky to... Uh, well, they don't want to obviously lose male places, so they want to bring the women up to the same number as the men, but it's going to be very difficult, and I think they might have to meet somewhere in the middle. Um, so uh, I don't know if that those answers will have satisfied people, but that, that's that's the UCI position on it at the moment. So uh, we look forward to the Olympics and obviously the track racing as well there, um, and BMX and the mountain biking, of course. But what else are you looking forward to, Rose? What else have you got on your list? My list? Well, um, it's funny that you say about the uh, track racing at the Olympics because um, what I was going to talk about was young riders. And one of the young riders that is obviously going to do very well is Chloe Dygert, the uh, world champion in the individual time trial um, from the last world championships in Yorkshire. Um, she's only 23, but she'll be returning to track. So what I really want to talk about are the other young talents uh, that are out there in the peloton who are going to be sticking uh, on the road. And um, we've already seen a bit from um, Sarah Gigante, who's the now the Aussie time trial champion. And last year she was the road race champion. Um, she's only 19 years old, which I... which and the reason uh, when I spoke to her, I thought she was 20 is because she was born in 2000. And when I see people who are born in 2000, it kind of, it blows my mind a little bit to see people who are so talented and able and are born at this time that I still kind of think that we're not that far Seems away like from. Yesterday, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I know. Um, but yeah, so she's uh, already a uh, champion and I uh, spoke to her and this is what she had to say. First of all, congratulations on your TT title. Were you, were you kind of expecting that you were going to win the title straight away? Uh, thank you. And no, definitely not. I didn't think I would get on the podium. I was hoping top five was like, that would be really exciting for me. And yeah, when I crossed the line, I heard them saying my name. And I thought it was because I might have slipped into the under 23 lead. <laughs> uh, but then they kept saying it. Like, Shara Gillo, I think she was the writer after me. And they kept saying my name, like, and I was like, why are they still going on about under 23s? So like, shouldn't they be talking about elites for the last few riders? And then I had to ask, like, four people on my way to the hot seat. I'm like, wait, it, am I actually lead, leading the elites right now? It was crazy. And then, yeah, I was on the hot seat. I was meant to be sitting down in the hot seat. But I was, like, standing up next to the commentators trying to read their screen and see what was happening because I was in so much shock yeah and that's I mean that's amazing to also have been the road race champion last year and then come and take the TT title this year what was it like last year because you would have been a, a people would know who you are now but last year you were a complete unknown yeah I think last year was like this time trial was just yeah really surprising um but last year was just another level I think entirely so it was my first time uh, racing against the elites. I was first year under 23s, just came out of school and turned up. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd been doing pretty well in the junior category in under 19s, but that's like a whole different world to racing elites. So, yeah, I just turned up hoping that I'd get to finish the race. I just couldn't believe it last year when I won the road race from the early breakaway and then this year to come away with the time trial and now have the double uh yeah it's pretty pretty special to think about you're only is it 20 years old uh 19 19 yeah still 19 so tell us a bit about kind of how different your life has been perhaps to some of your friends from school yeah it is a bit different i still did um full-time uni last year but i had to do a lot of it by correspondence because of traveling for races so yeah even then I started to see the the real difference between my life and what my life might be like if I wasn't a cyclist but no I love being a cyclist and I love how my life is right now so hopefully I can yeah keep enjoying the cycling and keep it going in the future 
And Sarah, tell us a bit about the uh, road race this year, um, how your race panned out and the fact that the winner was a champion like Amanda Spratt. Yeah, there was a really strong field, um, lots of individual riders um, and also FTJ. I thought they'd be really strong. So, yeah, I think anyone could have won and also lots of Spratty's teammates are super strong. But Spratty had an awesome ride and really helped out by Grace Brown. Grace was amazing too. So, yeah, she really deserved that title and I can't wait to see all the races she does this year wearing the green and gold. With you joining TIBCO and doing more races, bigger races, what do you think your challenges are going to be this year? Yeah, I'm sure it will be hard in parts, the big step up, uh, racing in such strong and massive fields over really yeah, hard terrain. But I'm just really excited to learn from my teammates. They're super experienced and they've done this before. So, yeah, hopefully I can learn a lot and keep improving and just have a lot of fun doing it be a good teammate do you see that there's a lot of young talent coming through the, the fact that you can go to a time trial and and be a, a really strong uh, field do you sense that you're part of a wave of of a new generation of of um talent yeah i think it's really exciting to see lots of strong riders coming through um mixing it up with the older more experienced girls um even in our national championships uh, in the criterion, Ruby Roseman Gannon, she came second overall. So she won the under 23s. I think she's 21 years old. And she only lost the elite title to Chloe Hosking by less than, oh, I don't know exactly, but maybe a rim worth. Like they, it was a photo finish. And yeah, super close. So it's just really exciting. There's lots of other young riders here at the Tour Down Under as well. And I'm sure. A lot of them are super strong. Yeah, it's really cool to see and I'm inspired by the other young riders. I look at them and I'm like, ooh, they can do it, maybe I can too. So she's not the only teenager or the only person under 23 who are doing big things. A few people that I think we should look out for this year are Penilla Matheson, who is 22, an extremely good um, time trialist, uh, a, a Dane who uh, rides for Team Sunweb, um, and Leanne Lipper as well, who is also at Sunweb, who is 22 years old. And we saw her going one-on-one against Cashinevia Doma, didn't we, at stage four in Burton Dasset at the Women's Tour this year. And she put on a great performance. But Sunweb have an incredibly uh, young team. I think their average age is 23. And if you compare that to a team like Mitchelton Scott, where their average age was is 30 um it's yeah they're quite significantly younger but they are setting themselves up as a development squad i'm sure they talked to you a bit about that all when you went to their um team launch uh, at the end of last year yeah they're very much a, a team for the future really sunweb um and some excellent talent amongst them and uh one of them being Pfeiffer Georgie, who is now doing her second year at Sunweb, um, but her first full year, because last year she completed her A-levels while also riding for Sunweb, which was phenomenal. Um, I think she got, oh, I don't want to get this wrong, her dad told me, um, I think it was all A's or mostly A's while she was um still having her commitment to Sunweb. So this is her first full year, which is really exciting for her. And um, I think... She feels like it's it's quite a big step for her, even though she'd been in the team last year. So it's a great way to sort of initiate yourself, I guess. Um, but here's what she had to say at the Team Sunweb launch. I mean, it's nice, I thought, when you were all coming down the stairs one after the other and the men's team and the women's team were all mixed together. So it wasn't that you had the women's team first or the men's team first. It feels like they're trying to engender some sort of a, a bigger team ethos, really. Is that how it feels on the inside? Yeah, definitely. I think with this team, it's quite special because it's a bit more integrated with everyone. And... I think that's coming more in the sport, but yeah, I think for me, this team is quite special in that respect and it's nice. You can learn from each other, hang out and yeah, it's a nice environment to be in. How much do the teams mix or how much are you aware of being on a mixed team as opposed to like a women's only team? Yeah, so uh, from here we're going to Calpe with the men's team and we'll stay in the same hotel. So it's time to just bond and 
the experts from different areas kind of mix over teams so stuff they find in the men can cross over to the women so we benefit from everything really which is really nice and what about 2020 then you got get to concentrate on just being a bike rider that's yeah. quite exciting isn't it yeah definitely school's done and i'm so happy it was luncheon and work and everything around the races and yeah i didn't have the as many races i wanted to because of the exams um, and now I can be a full-time bike rider, which is the dream. <laughs> How was that? Because for people listening who don't maybe know your full story, last year you were riding with the team for the first time, but you were also doing your A-levels on the side. And you did very well in your A-levels, I understand, from your dad. Um, but how was that chuckle? Yeah, um, at times it was hard, but the team kind of let me have a bit of a break from racing so I could just knuckle down, get the work done. Um, yeah, I mean, it was stressful because... I'm quite a, I don't know, put a lot of pressure on myself to get good results and to be strong in cycling. Um, so it was hard, um, but yeah, it's over now. I'm happy with my results. It went better than I expected, so yeah. Are you glad you did it that way then? Because there would be an argument for getting those A-levels done, getting them out of the way, and then concentrating on being a pro rider. But are you glad that you mixed the two and that you've got that year under your belt, almost like a, a run-up to the jump? Yeah, 100%. I feel if you get offered from World Tour team, it's a bit crazy to say no. And the whole ethos of the team for the women is development. And that's what they said from the start. And they said, We're not, we don't want you to go win races the first year. And we know you've got your exams. So it's all about yeah, developing on and off the bike. So definitely the right decision. So no need to win races last year. What about 2020? What are your goals? What are your big ambitions for the year? I think kind of similar to last year, just learning still. Um, I'm doing some different races, uh, so trying to work out who I am as a rider, I guess, and kind of finessing my strengths because as a junior, you kind of have to do everything. And yeah, I still don't know really what my expertise is, so just finding that, I guess. So that's five for Georgie at Team Sunweb, um, expecting big things from, from her. Just on Sarah Giganti as well, who we heard from a bit earlier, um, she's also another great student apparently um, I was told she got perfect score in her final year at school and is studying science at Melbourne University her older brother is doing a PhD at Yale so an intelligent family bright bright people and I, I mean we uh, we heard from Sarah Giganti there um, you know incredibly young when she won the road race last year that was a real shock for her to to win that race ahead of some really um, established and you know world-class riders at the age of just 18 um, but to back it up in the time trial this year is almost more impressive isn't it because the time trial is there are no lucky winners in that race and she's stepping up this year um, and she sounds you know you are struck by her youth hearing her talk as well and just realizing how young she is but um, she's got a great future if uh, she dedicates herself to to cycling but the list you've got there Rose are there more names on your list of young writers to look out for. Richard is always peering at my notes. I'm just I've very impressed. That. I'm just very impressed that you notes. come with all these notes. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. No, nobody else I podcast with comes with notes. <laughs> um, you know, the other person I was going to point out actually was Lisa Balsamo, who's uh, 21 years old. She rides for Valcar. She's a sprinter. Um, I think that, I think that, Lorena Weber's had a uh, bit of a breakthrough year last year, and I think that maybe Elisa Balsamo might have a breakthrough year this year. But obviously, riding for Valcar means that her attendance at all the big races is a little, you know, can't be um, guaranteed, which is a shame. But um, this year, she won a lot of races, not big races, but what I would say is more important is the, the uh, caliber of competitors that she beat. So she beat Vibas, she beat uh, Arlena Sierra, she beat, she beat Corinne Rivera, she beat Master Bastianelli, she beat Chloe Hoskin. And really, those are all the riders that you would, in you know, this time and place that you would want to beat if you were in a sprint. So I'm expecting um, very big things from her uh, for this season. And Lorena Vibas herself, of course, um, still very, very young. Demi Vollering on that team too. But it's going to be entertaining to watch what happens at that team, isn't it? Well, that's the thing. It'll be interesting to see the dynamic of the whole team now, really, because um, I know we've, we've mentioned it anyway, but 
I don't know, we haven't dwelled very much on the fact that this case, the case was going to court, you know, that the team were going to, to sue Vibus for breach of contract and that's how they finally got to the situation where it has been resolved. But the fact that the team will know that she doesn't want to ride with them, she said publicly, you know, she thinks that they're a great bunch of girls, she loves riding with them, I think it's more a management issue as much as anything else, but it's bound to affect the dynamics of that team. So, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how they fare. And a money issue as well, I would think, um, mm. given some of the other teams that are interested in signing her. Money and support, you know. I mean, she will end up, I'm sure, at one of these teams, but the first six months or so of the year, when a lot of her, the races, you mentioned them earlier, rose some of these classics she would fancy. So it will that will be interesting. My final thing to look forward to was Rolf Aldag at, at Canyon Shram. Um, he is coming over as sports director. He's been uh, Dimension Data for a few years and, and had a, a not a great time there, I don't think. I never got a great great vibe from him there, but let's not um, kind of overlook his incredible record as a as a DS at HTC High Road and then at, at Quick Step as well. And he went to Quick Step at the same time as Brian Holm. And I think those two were quite instrumental in turning that, that team around from being an underperforming team really um, when they, they joined to becoming the 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 kind of the machine that they are now and he's had an unhappy time I think at Dimension Data probably for uh, complicated reasons um, I don't think we've seen the best of him there but you know whenever I've spoken to him at races he's an incredibly impressive guy to speak to um, his uh, his knowledge of racing his understanding of racing, his interest in people as well. Um, he really wants you, if you ask him about a rider he works with, he will he will give you chapter and verse on them. And he really, you know, he gets, he really understands people, I think. And and I think it's a great, um, it's a great kind of coup for Canyon Shram to get him uh, involved. And I think it's a, it, it's good for um, women's cycling as well to have, a, have somebody with that, of that caliber, I think, because I do think that he's, one of the one of the great sort of DSs of the last sort of couple of decades. It'll be interesting to see how he makes that transition, though. Um, I don't think it's inevitable that you can translate success in the men's side of it to women's. I think the dynamics and the culture are very, very different. Um, how you deal with the riders, I would imagine, would be very different in a men's team compared to a women's team. How you lead them, how you direct them, how you um, forge cooperation and teamwork. So. Um, I think that's going to be quite a learning curve for him. I think I think it's brilliant as well. And um, he's obviously got so much experience to bring to that team. But I wouldn't expect it to immediately just gel. I, I, it's going to be quite a culture shift, I would think. Yeah, I think also in the racing as well, it's, it's mm. different. The kind of tactics that would work in a men's race when you have a lot more riders at your disposal to... You, you can just use up a rider to... Uh, bring an important breakaway back. Um, you can't do that with women's cycling mm. because instead of having nine riders, say you have or you have or eight riders, you have six riders, and um, so it's just the the dynamic is very different of the 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 tactics. So it'll be interesting how he adapts to learning about racing in a different way. Um, De- definitely, and then does it. I, I think what's interesting is he's not been brought in to run the. The team. He's not being brought in as the the, the main man in charge. He is. Uh, he's working below Ronnie Lauka, who whose team it is and who runs things. So he's not. Um, he's not coming in to 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 run the team the way that he wants to run it. He's sort of fitting into an already established system there, I guess. But nevertheless, I'm looking forward to hearing. You know, his take on things. He's very. I think he's very honest as well, um, and he's been honest about having to learn uh, a lot and really start from scratch uh, in this job. So I look forward to seeing how that how that pans out. But I think it's an interesting signing. Shall we wrap things up there? Um, it's late in uh, Amsterdam. It's quite late here. You've got an early start, Orla. Always an early start. I've got a near one-year-old. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it's lovely to sort of see in these winter nights with you both. It's a lovely, cosy way to to pass my Wednesday evening. Wednesday, isn't it? Yeah, Wednesday evening. Um, but yeah, it's time. It's really time I get into my pyjamas. I've got my hot water bottle here already. Um, wow. I'm halfway into bed, so um, I probably better wind down for the night. I feel like I need... Um, what's that BBC programme? Bedtime Story, is that mm. it? Yeah, Bedtime the one Stories, that, um, yeah. Where they have a celebrity needed. reader story. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I need um, what's the name of that actor that did it? <laughs> I've got off on the right tangent now. Do you remember? He's in Piggy Blinders, and he did. Um, he's like really famous. Tom Hardy. That's it. Oh, Tom I need Hardy. Tom Hardy to read me a bedtime story. <laughs> <on the ground. laughs> Don't, so we Don't we all? Don't we all? Rich is looking very, very excited about the thought of that. Yeah. We need to wrap up because we've had quite a f- few beers now because it's been going on a f- long time. It's been a night out, Rose, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, really? I mean, and I've, been... got, I've still got to go home and cook. And I don't yeah. know. Have you? Right yeah, beans, oh, it's going to be beans on toast, oh, I wow. think. Yeah. Oh. Right, well, uh, I'll like... send you some of my homemade cottage pie across, Rose. We've got some oh, left over. That would be <laughs> Homemade right. cottage pie. You've got too much time on your hands, Orla. Yeah. I know. Who's making well, really cottage pie? It's a pleasure. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, excuse me. We we, sh- we should wrap things up. We'll be back next month um, with the, the next the February episode of the Cycling Podcast. Family. That's Andy. Family That's Andy. Family. Andy. <laughs> and I think we're hoping to go to Hen Newsblad, aren't we? At the end of February, uh, are we hoping to do um, that? Yeah, well, I'm happy to do we that. Are to be, not. <laughs> yeah, I to don't be know. discussed. I don't be, know what we're doing. Oh, We've I'll, talked about doing something fun in February anyway. Fun, around fun my in yes. February. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, listen. Thank you very much, Orla. Thank you both very much. It's been a joy. Thank you, Rose. That's a bit of I feel don't know I can't follow up on all his unfettered happiness <laughs> that she's putting no, no, out. Not a happiness, dash of kindness negativity and gratitude. Helps. Okay, <laughs> kindness. Okay. So well, it was alright. See you next time. It was alright. Thanks, ladies. Mm-hmm.